Amen for that. Brother Daniel, you ready to come on up? All right, come on up. Well, good evening, everyone. Glad to see everybody made it. Let's see, Brother Robinson started with a joke, and uh, Brother Bibb said, I better use my Bible tonight. So uh, I, I guess I'll give you all my life's verse. It's Isaiah 28, 20, which is, For the bed is shorter than that a man can stretch himself on it, and the covering narrower than that he can wrap himself in it. It's in the book. So I will say uh, it's been a rare situation that I've ever been on a bed that I felt was actually long enough for me where my toes weren't getting scrunched up at the end, where the sheets tucked in. And so it's, it's, it's one of the trials and tribulations of my life. Pray for me, you know. So, <laughs> all right. So I, I got my Bible verse in, so now I'm, I'm good to go, right? <laughs> all right. I'm going to take a, a, a moment um, and uh, introduce myself and my family. I know that there's some folks who weren't here. Uh, I did speak back in uh, November, I believe it was, and uh, Brother Knight said, you know what, there's been some folks come in that, that weren't here uh, when y'all came in and stuff. And so take a, just a real brief uh, moment, introduce yourself in your ministry just very briefly, but after that I'm going to preach. I've got something that God's put on my heart, and we're, and we're going to preach. But my name's Daniel Williams, and uh, most of you know my brothers, Andrew and Paul, and my, my father and mother, uh, Brother Max and, and uh, Sister Martha, and uh, that's a lot of my family. I've got a couple other sisters in other parts of Texas, and one brother up in heaven. Uh, thank the Lord for that. Um, but uh, raised in a, just a, a good, godly Christian home there, uh, not perfect, uh, there's no perfect one here on earth, unfortunately, but a good godly Christian home, and I thank my mother and father for that, for bringing me to church and gave me a benefit that, that not everyone in this room had. My wife did not have that benefit. She was raised in a Catholic home with very poor doctrine, and they were even poor Catholics at that, maybe only attending uh, church on Christmas and Easter and such like that. Uh, but a soul winner from a, a church that had the truth of the gospel when she was 18, invited her to a church activity. They didn't even take the time to try to witness to her in the street. You know, sometimes just inviting somebody to, oh, you know what, there's a derby next week and my kid is gonna race his little wooden car. You know, just telling that to your coworker, they might be like, you know what, that might be fun to watch. I'll come out at four, watch that, and stay for church afterwards. You, you don't know. But that's what happened to my wife. She was 18 years old, lost and on her way to hell. And just somebody from a church that had the gospel invited her to a church activity. And she didn't make it for that first one. They invited her again. And they didn't give up. Um, they knew that she needed the truth. And uh, I think, I think, I thank that person and that church for that. Uh, we went to Bible college. I met her at Bible college. And uh, we graduated back in the early 2000s. And God allowed us the privilege of serving on the mission field in, in the country of China uh, from 2004 to 2010. And uh, it was a great blessing. A big piece of my heart is still there. People were saved. People were baptized. Lives were changed. People were discipled and there's still fruit that remains. There are still people there teaching and preaching the gospel under a communist regime without the liberties and freedoms that we have. Knowing those pastors and such, knowing that at any moment, their department, the, the, the communist government, could break in and throw them in jail, or worse, and, uh, and things, but it was a great, Great, great blessing on my life. Uh, we returned in 2010 to deal with some medical issues that our family had and uh, dealt with those things. And then in 2018, God started working on my heart. Uh, just, just spent a lot of time in prayer and uh, counsel with my pastor. And in 2019, he showed us uh, that he could still use us in the mission field and showed us that that place was the Philippines. Um, Unfortunately, China is extremely closed right now. Um, and those of you 
uh, who do pray for world missions, uh, pray for the very few missionaries that are still there because most of the ones that were in there when, when we were in there have all been expelled and not allowed uh, back in. Uh, but uh, my wife is Filipino, and uh, so got, that was something God set up, and he allowed us to serve him there in China for six years, and then now uh, he's pointing us to the Philippines, and we're on deputation. We're basing our, minist- our deputation out of this area. We've got family and, and things like that here, and so we are here a lot uh, and help out in the choir and different things and, and are glad to help out and jump in uh, as, as able, but there are many times when we're not here because we'll be at another church and such. So just pray for us and uh, pray that God will speed our deputation. Things have been very slow. Uh, again, there are a lot of churches and a lot of states that are still dealing with the effects of the whole COVID thing. Uh, and so there's a, a lot of areas that have, are still either under stricter regulations than Texas is or churches that were almost kind of like burned a little bit and they're, they're real hesitant right now. So it's, it's definitely been a little slower than I'd like for it to be, but I'm trusting that it's in his timing. So uh, that's it for introduction. I'm happy if any of you have any questions, you know, if I'm here and available, I'm happy to answer questions uh, before or after services anytime uh, or uh, as you like. Let's turn in the book, in the Bible to... Second Kings, Second Kings, Second Kings chapter 18, and uh, the message tonight, I, I had a couple other messages I thought I was going to uh, speak, and uh, the Holy Spirit just wouldn't let me do that, and, uh, and uh, kept pushing me towards uh, this story about a really, really good Christian, a man named Hezekiah, good King Hezekiah. And we're going we're gonna to kind of um, walk through his life and look at a lot of, uh, just kind of look at his life and apply it to our lives. Uh, I'm speaking tonight to, again, I'm going to assume that the people in this crowd or that this message is prepared for those who say that they're Christians, those who say they've been bought with the blood of Christ and that, that when you die, you know that you're going to go to heaven. If there's anyone in this room that doesn't know that, at, this, at the end of this uh, message, there will be an opportunity for you to come forward and myself or there's many other folks here would gladly and would love to take the Bible and show you how that you could know for sure, without a doubt, that when, you, when your body passes, that your soul would be in heaven. So um, there are still true principles that could apply to even you or those who are listening or watching on the internet, even if you say you're not saved. But primarily, this message is going to be speaking to those who say, I belong to Christ. So we're going to read the first seven verses. Uh, Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, uh, Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abby, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that, that David his father did. And I'll just pause right there. That's got to be amazing to him, for him to be in glory realizing that God put in his Bible the phrase, he, Hezekiah, did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. What an what a epitaph. If, if I could, if I pass, you know, one day when I pass, if I could literally just have that phrase on my tombstone, just said, uh, Daniel Williams did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. That would be good enough for me. Uh, just doing right according to what God wants, is really just what Christianity is. But we'll, we'll continue. Uh, he did that according to all that David his father did. He removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. 
He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. For he clave. That, it means he, he was glued. He, 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 he stuck to. He clave to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him. What another great phrase. Just saying the Lord was with him. I, that's what I want every day in my life. I just want to know that the Lord is with me. Occasionally there have been days when I got back and I'm heading to bed and I realize that was a day that I did on my own. And that was not a successful day in the eyes of the Lord. But any day that the Lord was with me, that was a successful day. And the Lord was with him and he prospered whithersoever he went forth and rebel, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. So Hezekiah was a good king. He was a great king. Uh, even though it's comparing him to David saying he did according to all that David his father did. And many, many times uh, the kings of Judah were compared to David. Um, but even in verse 5, it says, He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. God's really putting this guy up, saying none of the kings of Judah after him or before him. It doesn't really clarify. David was really the king of the whole nation of Israel before Judah was separated. So I think right here, um, uh, the Bible here is specifying just that, that group of kings who were just the kings of Judah. But it's God is really putting him up and saying, Hezekiah, you're my man. You did good. You, and, and, and really, and, and there's, uh, we're going to kind of go between 2 Kings chapter 18 and, Chronicle, and 2 Chronicles 28. They're parallel passages, but they both have uh, of the life of Hezekiah. Uh, but for the most part, we're going to stay within these two uh, passages, uh, 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. But he was a good king. He really tried to do what was right. And we're going to go through some things he did right. He tried and worked hard at leading the nation towards righteousness. And that's what all of us as Christians should be doing. We may not be a king, but we all lead someone. Okay? I lead my wife, and I lead my children, and I lead those who, to whom I witness, those to whom I, I, I hope to disciple, those to whom I dis, witnessed to, saw saved, baptized, discipled in the past, and are still relying on me to keep straight. And those future people that I will lead uh, in whatever job you have, uh, you may lead a group of people or a team of people or, or whatever, but no matter what, all of us lead someone, even if that someone is only ourself. And I'm not going to go there, but in the book of Proverbs, it indicates that the greatest act of leadership known to man is leading oneself. Uh, because if you can't lead yourself, how can you, ex uh, if you can't lead, lead yourself well, how can you expect to lead others well? So all of us are leaders, and all of us should strive to emulate the good that Hezekiah had. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going, to, we're going to continue. Dear Jesus, I thank you for this time, this place, and these people, Lord. I pray that I would use the words that you would use were you here. Holy Spirit, speak through me, and may each of us, myself included, leave this place with more truth, more knowledge, and a greater desire to live for you. In your name we pray, amen. amen. So Hezekiah was a good king. I, the Bible very clearly. I'm going to go through some of the good and righteous things that he did. Uh, let's flip over to 2 Chronicles 29, and we'll read the first three verses. Like I said, we're going to kind of bounce back and forth a little bit. A parallel passage, but this tells what he literally did the first day he became the king. 
Hezekiah began to reign when he was five and 20 years old. This is 2 Chronicles 29, and we're going to look at the first three verses. And he reigned nine and 20 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's uh, name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. He, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. And then in a, a verse, a couple of pages, uh, a couple of verses down, it indicates it was literally the first day of the first month of his reign. So it's literally, he becomes king, and the first thing he does is goes to the temple and opens the doors. Now, why did he do that? Because his father, King Ahaz, a wicked king, a couple of verses up, if you'll look at verse uh, chapter 28, verse 24 and 20, uh, verse 20. Uh, four, and Ahaz gathered together the vessels of the house of God and cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God. Literally the candlesticks and the censers and the different vessels uh, that they used in the temple for sacrifices and for different, different things. He cut them up, destroyed them, and shut up the doors of the house of the Lord, and he made him altars in every corner of Jerusalem. So King Hezekiah's father had literally shut down the, the temple, literally shut down the house of God and had forbidden worship of the one true God. And Hezekiah, while his father was alive and, and things, his father was king, he couldn't di directly necessarily go against him without getting his head cut off. But he said, my father died, I'm king day one, and uh, we, can, we can go right, I'll go to it in a sec. Literally day one, he walks to the temple and says, open the doors. We're restoring the worship. Amen. And, 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 and what, a, what an amazing just thing. You know, what an amazing, you know, I don't know if there's anyone in here like this, but I've heard uh, of, of teenagers who were forbidden by their parents to go to church. And so they said, well, I'm, I'm a child. I'm under, I'm, I'm under your guardianship. I, I live at your house. I have to obey, obey your rules. Now, we should obey God rather than man, but there's also the rule of obeying your parents and, and, and things like that. Um, but they said, on my 18th birthday, I'm going to church. And if you won't let me come home, that's fine. And they made that choice. I've heard of teenagers in Muslim countries, Pakistan or India, when they became uh, the age of majority, they said, okay, you can no longer have that rule over me. I'm going to go to church, and if you disown me, you disown me. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that somebody in this room, that could or would happen to you, but we should have the attitude of putting God first to where we would be willing to do that. Teenagers, are you willing? I, again, I hope that your parents walk for God. But teenagers, if your parents fall away or don't walk for God, are you going to be willing to do what Hezekiah did when his father passed? And he said, I have the authority now. I'm going to live for God. And he did it on day one, the very first day. Uh, he unlocked the temple. Uh, his father had locked up the temple and, and had destroyed the vessels. Uh, he led the Levites in cleansing and restoring the house of God. This whole chapter 29 of 2 Chronicles goes into the whole thing. The, the, the temple had gotten filthy. They had destroyed the vessels, maybe leaving the broken pieces all over the temple. It, it, go, just, it, was, it had gotten very filthy, and it needed to be sanctified. And uh, um, So he led the Levites in cleansing and restoring the house of God and in restoring the temple worship and the sacrifices. Now, a side anecdote, while he was leading the nation of Judah back towards God, the final king of Israel, King Hoshea, was on the throne, and there's not much said about him other than he did evil. Uh, it says he wasn't as evil as some of the other kings, but it says he, he did evil, and his, the nation of Judah, while Hezekiah is leading them towards righteousness, King Ho, Hoshea of Israel, the final, last king of the ten tribes of northern Israel, 
was leading his country into just dissipation. They were led into captivity, they were overthrown, they were destroyed, and the nation of Israel was, was no more, the, the ten tribes. So King Hezekiah was the king of the southern tribes of, uh, of Judah, often called just the king of Judah, and then King Hoshea was the king of the northern ten tribes. So just an interesting one king's leading his nation towards righteousness, while another king is leading his, na his nation into ruin and dissolution. And that nation has never existed since, as far as like that, until uh, 1948 when Israel was restored. Um, so Hezekiah restored the temple worship. This was accomplished in the first 16 days. In 2 Chronicles 29, 36, actually 17 through 19, it says, now they began on the first day of the first month to sanctify. So this is going back to literally his first day in office. It was the first day of the month. He walks over, says, open the doors, and he says, hey, let's deal with this. So the Levites say, now they began on the first day of the first month to sanctify, and on the eighth day of the month they came, uh, came they to the porch of the Lord, so they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days. So it took eight days to do the cleansing. It was filthy. They did all the cleansing and, uh, and cleaning, but it still took 16 days to finish up the rest of it. Uh, so they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days, and in the 16th day of the first month, they made an end. So literally 16 days after King Hezekiah walked into, the, uh, walked into office, he had already restored that. Um, and then if you go to 36... And Hezekiah re rejoiced, and all the people that God had prepared the people for the thing was done suddenly. They said, wow, the day before people were sacrificing the false idols out in the, out in the, in the streets, King Ahaz had put altars in, in different streets, and the temple was boarded up, the Levites were out of a job, they, the, 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 the worship uh, of the sacrifices and the things that God had set up was nothing. And 16 days later, it's fully restored. What a great change that King Hezekiah did in the, in the nation of Judah. That, that alone, if that was the only thing he accomplished as a king, would probably have been enough to earn him the title of, of, of uh, walking right before, before God. But he did more. He did more. Um, I'm not going to go into it deeply, but through his prayer life, he allowed God to have a great military victory over Assyria. I'm actually not going to go into this because I've got several more that I do want to focus on. But literally, the king of Assyria said, "Hey, we whooped up on the northern tribe. You know, we whooped up on your bro your big brother because the the nation of Israel was larger than the nation of Judah at that time, and the king of Assyria had come in, wiped them out." took him into captivity, and then he said, you know what, we want you too. And uh, the king of Assyria sent down some generals and, th and stuff. There, you can read it in the, in the passages. But King Hezekiah turned to God, and it's got a wonderfully worded prayer that he prays, and he said, God, do this for yourself, because they were making fun of God and saying, your God is nothing. And, and King Hezekiah said, God, I know that you are the true and living God, and I know that you can do this, and I ask you to do this for your name. And through his prayer life, uh, God came in and destroyed tens of thousands. Uh, the Bible indicates over 100,000 soldiers died, and the Assyrian army went back home, defeated by one godly Christian's prayer life. It wasn't by their military. It didn't, no, nowhere in the passage does it say that he fought battles with them. It says he prayed and, and the God came through. So again, a great, a great king, a good king, a great Christian even. Another thing he did, going back to uh, 2 Kings chapter 18, uh, and we already read this, but in verse 4, he destroyed an idol which had been around for about 700 years. It says he destroyed that brazen serpent, 
the brazen serpent that Moses had, had created and had put up on a pole and said, look and live and, and trust on this and, and you'll be saved. That was all a symbol looking forward to Christ being lifted up and how we look at Christ and live. But the Israelites over the years had turned it into an idol and were putting incense to it. And the Israelites had, had and other kings had just kind of allowed it. And King, and King Hezekiah said, no, this is wrong. We're getting rid of it. And he said he destroyed it. He didn't just put it up in a little box and say, well, this is a historical artifact. He said, let's get rid of it. In the book of Romans, it's, there's a verse that says, make no provision for the lust of, uh, for the flesh to fulfill the desires, the lust thereof. And that's what he said. He said, if we keep it around, there's going to come, come some other king who's going to let it back out. He, he destroyed it. And the, the name that he called it literally just means a mere piece of bronze. He, he's just said, this is nothing. And just like the idols of stone and wood and, and metal were nothing that, and you can find it all through the Old Testament, they couldn't, you know, they could do nothing and they were nothing. People kept going back to them because they wanted a physical presence of something that they could bow down and kneel to and, and sacrifice to. King Hezekiah took the step that all the other, King David, King Solomon, the other kings, they never took that serpent and said, this is wrong, we're getting rid of it. They, maybe they boxed it up, hid it in a shelf, whatever, but it kept coming back. And for around 700 years since Moses had, had carved it, that serpent had been a, 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 a stumbling block to the nation of, of Israel. Uh, what stumbling block do we have in our lives that we need to get rid of? Maybe we've boxed it up and hid it in a shelf and said, well, I'm not doing that now. But two years down the road, when we're at a weak point in our life, are we going to drag it back out? Is there something in our house that could be physical that we need to get rid of? And not just box it up and hide it, but literally take it and smash it and say, this is evil and wicked. Or maybe not necessarily something physical. Is there a stronghold of sin in our life? Something that we've kind of like, well, I'm, I'm okay for now. I'm, I'm good. God and I, we're, we're good. But we never have dealt with it and asked God to root it out and get it out of our lives. Kind of a side note there, but, but what do we have in our lives? Maybe we should pray and ask God to examine our lives and show us that brazen serpent in our life, that, that something in our life that we need to get rid of and destroy it, not just box it up and hide it up and, and pretty it up. It could even be, uh, it could even be something that's good, a blessing in our life that we're holding. That's what it was. The serpent was a blessing to the nation of Israel. It healed thousands of them and, and, and kept them from dying. Maybe there's even something good that we've had or done in our past that we're still hanging on to and saying, well, because I've done this good thing in the past, I don't need to be so worried about the present. Uh, there's two traps that we fall into. One is the trap of looking at the past and resting on our laurels, saying, I don't need to do anything today. The other trap is resting on our laurels today and saying, I don't care about the future and not preparing for the future. And I'll, I'll, I'll get there in a little bit. Um, you know, maybe we used to be a Sunday school teacher, but things happened, something got changed, and I haven't been doing that. Maybe a nursery worker could be a deacon, just a, you know, going to church visitation. Oh, by the way, this coming Saturday, 10:30, uh, drop your kids off at 10 for PE. Stay for 10:30 church visitation. Pass out some door hangers. Pass out some tracks. Uh, maybe pass out the gospel. Maybe see somebody's life, eternal destiny changed. So I'll be there, uh, Lord willing. But. Uh, just because we did something good for Christ in the past, what are we doing now? What are we doing now for Christ? Another thing King Hezekiah did in 2 Chronicles chapter 30, and it's really the whole chapter, but he led 
a, he led the nation of Israel in a great revival. First 16 days in office, he walks in, restores the temple worship. First 16 days. A couple years down the road, things have, been going, things have been going well. The northern tribe has now been destroyed, defeated, taken into captivity. King Hezekiah leads the nation of Judah in a great revival. But not only the nation of Judah, he actually reaches out. Uh, and we're not going to take the time, but the entire chapter, 2 Chronicles chapter 30, he reaches out to the northern tribes and says, hey, y'all have been away from God for way too long. Come back. Come back. And even though the nation of Israel had been defeated, had been taken into captivity, there were still a lot of Jews still living there that had not been taken into captivity. And there, every single king in the northern tribes had done wrong and done evil. There's, there's, there was not a single good king in the northern tribes the whole time. There were a few kings that were less bad, or less evil, but none of them, for none of them does the Bible say that they did right in the eyes, of, in the sight of the Lord. And Hezekiah said, even though y'all have been living wrong for hundreds of years, I'm going to reach out to you and try to restore you. So not only did he lead his own nation in revival, he reached out to those who had shown over through history that they had rejected God. And he reached out to them. In uh, chapter 30, verse... Make sure I'm on the right. In chapter 30, it says, he even interceded for those... There it is. In verse 17, it says, For there were many in the congregation that were not sanctified. So many of the people from the northern tribes came, but because they had been away from God for so long, they didn't have the practices, they didn't have the habits, and even the ones in, in Judah, whom his father, King Ahaz, had led astray, they were not sanctified properly. It says, therefore, the Levites had the charge of the killing of the Passovers for every one that was not clean to sanctify them unto the Lord. For a multitude of the people, even many of Ephraim and Manasseh, Issachar and Zebulun, had not cleansed themselves. Yet did they eat the Passover otherwise than it was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, the, Lord, the good Lord pardon every one that prepareth his heart to seek God. The Lord God of his fathers though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. And the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah and healed the people. It indicates here that because they were worshiping God improperly, and God had set up rules for a reason. He wanted his people to show that there was a difference. And God had set up specific rituals and sacrifices and wanted them to be followed correctly and properly. But these people had not been trained well. They had been away from God for a long time. And King Hezekiah, again, has such a powerful prayer life that even though it indicates God had, had begun to cause some of them to be ill, it says God healed the people as a result of Hezekiah praying for them and saying, God, these people just haven't been trained properly, but they have a heart for you. God, I'm asking you to, to forgive, yes, they're making a mistake. Yes, they're making a mistake, but I'm asking you to forgive it for now. And it doesn't exactly say it, but obviously the implication is so that we can train them in what's right. Is there somebody in your life who may be a Christian, but maybe they're not following Christ maybe correctly in all, in all areas? We who may consider ourselves, and I, I'm not trying to put myself up at all, but those Christians who may have a little more knowledge, are we willing to pray for those and help them gently to lift them to where they need to be and not just step on them and say, you're not, you're not doing it right. Yes, they should be doing it right. Yes, those people should have been worshiping God correctly, but they didn't know any better. 
and Hezekiah's prayer life said, God, I can see their hearts, and they want to do right. Give them some time, God. Give them some time. And sometimes that's what we need to do. Now, it doesn't mean the person who knows to do right, and it's been 20 years, and they still won't give it up. That's a different matter. I'm talking about a newer Christian, somebody who doesn't know, has not been taught. Maybe they've never been in a good church that really had good doctrine. Uh, you know, honestly, the, the church that my wife got saved at, they had the gospel, and I'm so thankful. But honestly, they had some poor doctrine there. But they had the gospel, and I'm so thankful for that. And she had a heart for God, and she was able to get into a church that could teach her good doctrine a little bit uh, just a year later. And there may be people coming in, you know, this is their people come and go, like with the military, with the Fort, Fort Hood and everything. There may be people coming in who maybe the church that they attended had the gospel. They got saved. They have a heart for God, but maybe they just haven't gotten the doctrine. And let's pray for those and let's help them, just like King Hezekiah. Um, because, um, oh, another, another great thing he did. He led the nation in giving. Uh, in in 3024, it says he gave 1,000 bullocks and 7,000 sheep. And I'm, I'm going to move on quickly, but because he had an example and he gave a lot, the people also ended up giving a lot. Uh, the princes gave a lot. And then in, in chapter 31, it goes into uh, that they brought so much in, in 3110, the people gave so much that the priests couldn't even receive everything that was given. That'd be a pretty amazing. That'd be pretty amazing if all these bottles were filled up so much that they were overflowing and they had to go find some more. And, and I realize that's for a specific ministry, but if the coffers of the church were literally overflowing, that the church was just saying, please, we need, we need, please, we need more missionaries, please, we, we need more projects, please, we need to do more, because God was blessing the giving. And that's what, that's what happened there, and King Hezekiah led the way. He led the way. Uh, another great thing that he did, uh, and uh, most of us would know the story of his healing, uh, the prophet Isaiah came to him, he was sick, and the prophet Isaiah came to him and said, God has told me, you're going to die. And King Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed. And again, his prayer life was such that it tugged on God's heart, and God said, okay, 15 more years. And again, that's the, one of the, probably the most famous story. I'm not going to go into that. But he, he did all of those great things, and everything that I just showed you, and I, I, there's even more I could show you that I didn't fully go into, but all of those back up what I said at the beginning, where the Bible says, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that David his father did. And it says all of those wonderful, great things about it. But now we're going to wrap it up with Hezekiah made a mistake. And everything I've said so far is, is very applicable to we who say we're Christians, we who want to do those good things. We want to help others. We want to have that prayer life to pray for others. But Hezekiah made a mistake. Towards the end of his life, we're going to turn over to 2 Kings, chapter 20. Second Kings chapter 20. I'm going to read one other verse from Second Chronicles uh, 32, verse 25. But Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him. For his heart was lifted up, therefore there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. Hezekiah made two mistakes very close to the end of his reign. God did so much for him, destroyed the Assyrians, healed him, gave him 15 years, gave him a guaranteed 15. I mean, he didn't have to worry about anything. God had already said, you're going to live 15 more years. 
He didn't, I mean, he didn't have, like, all right, cupbearer, you can get out of here. I can drink and eat anything. Nothing's going to kill me. You know, God had done so much for him, and, and, but the Bible says it, li- it lifted up his heart. And he didn't give God the glory equal. Now, he gave God some glory, but it said didn't give God the glory equal to what the Lord had done for him. There, there's, a, there's a song that's been out, the, I don't know, 10 years, and, and it's one of my personal favorite songs. If I want to soften my heart, there's a, there's a list of songs that I'll try to listen to. And one of those songs, I think we've sung it here, maybe as a special or something, uh, is I Have Been Blessed. And if I want to soften my heart and just meditate on the goodness of God, I'll either sing that song or, or play that song. And yes, we have been blessed with so many things, but do we give God the glory equal to what he's blessed us with, or do we just give him this little bit? And King Hezekiah, with all of those great things, all of those great things that he did, God said right here towards the end, he said, because you did all of these great things and, and I worked through you these amazing, wonderful, great, righteous things, but you didn't give me the glory equal to how I used you. He said, you gave me some glory, but you didn't give me glory equal to what I deserved. What, does, what, what glory and praise does God deserve in your life and in my life? Are we fully acknowledging him? Are we giving him the glory? Or is it just a token? Oh, yeah, God saved me, thanks. You know, what, what's, you know, what's a blessing? Oh, God gave me breath today. I'm, I'm breathing. and I'm alive and I'm healthy. And, you know, just some token, some token glory. Or do we actually, and it doesn't have to be public, but in your private time, do you thank God and give him the glory and praise him? for the great things he's done in your life, or is it only for the little things he's done in your life? So I'm going to wrap this up quickly. That was one of his mistakes. His other mistake that the Bible records in 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 19, where I told you to turn, towards the end, he kind of got puffed up. The Babylonians sent some people over there just to say, hey, we're glad to hear that you got better. But in his pride, he had a little bit of pride and glory saying, look at all this, and he didn't give God the glory. Isaiah comes back to him and says, you know what? There's going to be a judgment coming. And in verse 19, uh, well, we'll start in 16 and we'll wrap it up right here. And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon, nothing shall be left, saith the Lord, and of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Now Isaiah tells him this great, terrible thing, and it was really all about not giving God the glory. What does Hezekiah do? Does he fall on his face and pray like he did, and the the Lord killed over 100,000 Assyrians? Does he fall on his face and pray uh, and restore all of those people back to health that were worshiping God improperly? Does he fall on his face to the wall and pray and God gives him 15 more years of life? We would think that such a great man of prayer, when he hears this judgment, would do the same thing, wouldn't you think? In verse 19 it says, Then said Hezekiah unto Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. And he said, is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? When I read this, I'm like, Hezekiah. Because Isaiah says, you'll go ahead and have peace for the rest of your days, but this judgment's going to come on your own descendants. And instead of falling on his face and praying, I mean, he he had an amazing prayer life. I wish I could have the prayer life Hezekiah did. I wish I could have those miracles in my life that Hezekiah had. Again, God killed over 100,000 soldiers because Hezekiah prayed. God healed these people who were not worshiping properly that was honestly an affront to God because they were not doing it the right way. God healed Hezekiah himself just because he prayed. And yet here, he hears this great judgment. All right, sometime after you die, there's going to come a great and terrible judgment and your your children are going to be killed and murdered and, and taken into captivity. 
And Hezekiah decides not to pray. He's like, you know what? I'm old, I'm tired. I'm a, as long as I got peace for the rest of my days, it's all good. That's literally what he says. And that's his second great mistake. Now, overall, over the course of his whole life, yes, he, the Bible says he did good. But when I look at that, I say, Hezekiah, wake up. What's, what are you doing? Your own children and grandchildren and your descendants and your whole nation, your whole legacy is going down the trash. And you're just saying, good is the word of the Lord, which thou hast spoken. Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? And he said, all I care about is today. I don't give a rip about the future. And I think that's a big, big, big mistake gigantic mistake and are there those of us in here today who say we're christians and i've got peace and happiness and i've got a good job and i've got good money but we're letting our children and our descendants and our legacy get away from us i personally know people who are christians best as i can tell i can't see their heart but according to their testimony in their life they're christians and yet they, they have not led their families properly. And their, their families are starting to break their heart and are starting to go against God and become anti-God. If you look at the very next king, Hezekiah's own son, Manasseh, became the most evil king of Judah out of all of the kings. And that shows, yes, Hezekiah was amazing and awesome for the present time. But obviously his answer and his own son's life showed that Hezekiah did not have the proper care and thought and prayer life for the future. Do we? Do we? Let's pray. Lord, I love you. This isn't necessarily the, the funnest sermon that I wanted to preach, Lord, but this is what you put on my heart. King Hezekiah was an amazing Christian in so many ways, and yet he made two mistakes at, at the end of his life, and maybe the one mistake of not caring for the future was kind of all through his life. He did such an amazing job while he was alive and while he was there, such an amazing prayer life, Lord. But Lord, at the end of his life, he said, it's all good. I just want peace. Lord, convict me if that's me. Show me where I need to change if that's me. And show the people in this room and those who may be watching on the internet, Lord, show the, those who say that they're Christians, help us to not sacrifice the future on the altar of the present. Help us to look at our children and our, our descendants and our legacy. Help us to look at those and do the right thing by them. Help us to pray for them the way that Hezekiah didn't. I truly believe, and, and, and you know, Lord, but I truly believe that if Hezekiah had gotten on his face and prayed, that, that you could have altered that judgment. But he, but he didn't. Lord, help each and every Christian in this room tonight to make the decision to live like the good of King Hezekiah and not like the two mistakes that he made in being proudful and in not, not being willing uh, in, and in placing the present over the future. Help us, Lord. Be with us, Lord. Amen. You can come and pray if you'd like.